And that's when she looked outside the front window of her house and saw that the red canoe, Orca, was missing. And she realised in that moment that John must have taken the canoe and gone out for a paddle. If a canoeist loses his oar and cannot retrieve it, he is at the mercy of the sea and currents and has to sit it out until he is rescued. We have got to remain optimistic that he is found. Fortunately, <clears throat> just before John's disappearance, Anne had taken out a number of life insurance policies on John's life because he was getting older and they wanted to be fully protected. This is Humans, true stories about the most intriguing parts of human behaviour, the good, the bad, and the downright horrific. In 2002, John Darwin was living in Seaton Carew, which is a seaside town in the northeast of England. He lived there with his wife Anne and he had two sons, Mark and Anthony. John and Anne lived in a six bedroomed house on the coast of Seaton Carew. And in the summer months, it would see a huge take up in tourism. If you were lucky, you could sit and see or watch and the luxurious um, Seaton Carew golf course was just down the road from John and Anne's house. John was incredibly proud of his seaside house and he took pride in being there for the tourists that would visit. But over the last few years, he'd seen a steep decline in people coming to visit not only his holiday home, but also the town of Seaton Carew. He and Anne owned 12 houses in that nearby area and as they saw tourism decline they obviously saw their profits decline and money was becoming a bit of an issue they were in quite a bit of financial trouble it's hailed by its residents not only for its tourism factor but also it's known as being one of the most beautiful towns in the northeast of england and with a population of just 6,000 people it does feel really small and unique but by the year 2000 the town was definitely not at its best in terms of tourism and economic growth. John worked at Home House Prison in Stockton, which is just about 10 miles away from where he was living. His day was pretty normal as far as work days were concerned. He'd done a night shift and when he finished, he got in his car and he drove the 20 minutes home to his house. Once he got there, because he'd done a night shift, he went straight to bed, had a bit of a sleep, not a full eight hours, but sort of a long nap. And then he got up and decided he wanted to go down to the shore and take his red canoe and go for a little paddle. It was a little after 4.30 p.m. when he left his house, pulled his red canoe, which he'd named Orca, to the shore and got in it and went out to sea. By 8.30 p.m., Anne had already arrived home and she'd called the prison to check in on John to make sure he made it to work okay and that he was okay. It was quite common because of the night shift pattern that they would often miss each other when coming and going from the house. And because she hadn't seen him, she hadn't run into him that day, she just wanted to call and check that everything was okay. But when she called the prison, she found out that John had never turned up for work. She began to worry quite quickly. It wasn't like John to not turn up for work and it definitely wasn't like him to not let her know and the fact that she'd searched the entire house and he wasn't there she just didn't know where on earth he could be and that's when she looked outside the front window of her house and saw that the red canoe orca was missing and she realized in that moment that john must have taken the canoe and gone out for a paddle because of the urgency of the situation and the fact that John had clearly gone out to sea and just not returned home. Anne called the authorities and reported him as missing at 9.30 p.m. that evening. And immediately a search was launched for him. And this included the police and also the Coast Guard officers. The search crew, which consisted of an RAF helicopter, five lifeboats and a police plane with heat seeking equipment, worked their way across the entire coastline stretching from Hartlepool all the way to Staithes in North Yorkshire, and this was a 62 square mile radius. The Coast Watch, the Coast Guard, the Sea Air Rescue, the North East Air Support Unit, and the Royal National Lifeboat Institution were all involved in this search. And it was obviously an extremely dangerous task, and it lasted for hours and hours over into the next morning. One of the lifeboat support officers, Dave Kamish, 
told the BBC that at just after 1am that morning, they had retrieved a paddle from just past North Gare, which isn't far from Seton Carew and the part of the coast that uh, John had last been seen in. He added, quote, if a canoeist loses his oar and cannot retrieve it, he is at the mercy of the sea and currents and has to sit it out until he is rescued. We have got to remain optimistic that he is found." End quote. The search was called off because it was so dark, but it was resumed the next morning as soon as possible, so at 5am. But unfortunately, after another few hours of searching and no sign of John, they had to call the search off again. At this point, Anne had to come to terms with the fact that her husband John was likely dead. And although obviously this was incredibly devastating news, the more tragic thing was that she was gonna have to tell her adult sons, Mark and Anthony, that their father had died. After she told Mark on the phone, he drove the 300 miles from Basingstoke up to Hartlepool. He was living in Basingstoke at the time, but dropped everything to come and comfort his mum and be together as a family. He arrived early the next morning and even before he got out of the car, he saw his mum in the doorway and she was sobbing and she collapsed to her knees. She fell into his arms crying that she'd lost him. The next few weeks and months were hell for Anne. She was obviously incredibly distraught and on top of this she was worrying how she was going to cope financially. Generally John had been the breadwinner in the family and she was unable to see how she would make ends meet now that he was gone. Fortunately, <clears throat> Just before John's disappearance, Anne had taken out a number of life insurance policies on John's life because he was getting older and they wanted to be fully protected. Anne had been struggling to get any sort of closure after John had disappeared because his body had never been found. And she told a local newspaper that all she wanted to do was bury his body because that would allow her to move on. She also said that she felt like it was difficult to bring things to a close and felt like she was in constant limbo because his body had never been found. In 2002, police were deployed to search the Blue Lagoon Beach of Hartlepool, which is like a rocky, wide open area of sea in the northeast. They came across a paddle and a section of a red canoe which they believed could be John's. So at this point they called Anne and asked her to come down and identify them if she could and when she arrived she broke down in tears and she confirmed that yes those did belong to John. Just three months later shocking news came when Anne received a call saying that they thought they'd found the body of her husband off of the coast of Hartlepool and she'd need to come down and identify it. She agreed and just as she was about to leave to go and identify the body, she got another call confirming that the body had actually been independently confirmed as the body of someone else, it was not John. Anne broke down on the phone and she began crying and she told the liaison officer that had called her that she just wanted to lay John's body to rest. Over the next few months, various witness appeals were launched and in September of 2002, the detective inspector on the case at that time said that although there were a number of people on the beach at the time of John's disappearance, unfortunately no one had come forward admitting to having seen him that day. Specifically, they wanted to talk to a windsurfer who had been seen at that time and also three men who had been seen in a parked car nearby. Anne also put out a press release saying that she believed her husband had died at sea but was appealing for more information. A little over a year after John's disappearance, a coroner's inquest was conducted and it concluded that John had probably experienced difficulties whilst out at sea and had died as a result and so John was officially declared dead. John's wife Anne and sons Mark and Anthony all attended that inquest. After that Anne told the liaison officer that this was actually a good thing, at least now she and her sons would be able to move on and get on with the rest of their life. Anne arrived home on the 16th of April 2003 
And at this point, she began to actually sort through all of the life insurance policies that she'd taken out on John. Obviously, this had been many, many months in the making. She was sort of waiting for this point. She spent all this money on taking out life insurance policies. And then when John did disappear and was assumed dead, she couldn't actually cash them in until that coroner's inquest had been conducted. The payouts were 25,000 from his life insurance policy, another 25,000 from his teacher's pension, 58,000 from his prison pension, and 137,000 from a mortgage insurance policy, as well as an extra 5,000 from the Department of Work and Pensions. This total amounted up to around £250,000, which is obviously a huge amount of money. And it meant that Anne was able to pay off some of the debts that were because of those 12 houses that she and John owned, and also meant that she would have financial security for the rest of her life. She and her two sons wouldn't have to worry. Life continued as normally as possible for Anne, Mark and Anthony. At the time, Mark was living in Basingstoke and Anthony, who was three years younger than Mark, was just trying to get on with his life as normally as possible. The two were grieving the loss of their father and they were having to do this without his body being found. So there was certainly a lack of closure there. And on top of this, they were incredibly worried about their mother, Anne. She had dealt with the loss of her husband by sort of shifting her life slightly. She was trying to get away from the life that she had with John and was attempting to build a new life for herself elsewhere. In 2004, she went on holiday to Cyprus and the purpose of her going out there was actually to see if she liked it enough to live there. She wanted to get away from the cold coast of Seat and Karoo and the memories, the sad grieving memories of her husband. But it wasn't long after this trip to Cyprus that she decided that wasn't the right place for her and she started searching elsewhere. And she went to visit Panama, which is in Central America. Anne was attracted to the beautiful beaches and idyllic islands of Panama, as well as the fact that Panama City is considered the most cosmopolitan capital of Central America. And so it was late 2007 when she finally decided that she was gonna move out there and she started beginning to pack up her life and get ready to leave Seton Carew and unfortunately leave her sons as well. But they were supportive of her and they knew that if she was happy, they'd be happy. At the beginning of this story, I mentioned that Anne and John owned 12 properties in that Seton Carew area. And so during her time getting ready to move to Panama, she actually sold a number of these properties so that when she was moving, she had nearly a million pounds to start her new life with. Let's just pause here for a second uh, to talk about the fact that this story up to this point is pretty average. It, it's tragic for sure. Man goes uh, paddling in Hartlepool and goes missing and is assumed dead. It's tragic and it's unlikely, but it is possible it could have happened. Also, we don't know that he's dead his body has never been found. So it could just be that he has ended up stranded somewhere. That also could be a possibility. Again, it's unlikely, but it's possible. Well, on a cold, rainy evening in December of 2007, at 5.30 p.m., a white, middle-aged man walks into a police station in the West End and he tells officers, quote, I think I am a missing person. Officers were as confused as the man who had just walked in. He told them that he didn't remember anything pre-2000, but he did know what his name was, he knew his date of birth, and he knew that he had a wife and two sons up in Seton Carew, or at least he used to. So officers immediately call up to Seton Carew and they try and get in contact with Anne, but they're told that, unfortunately, she no longer lives there. She's moved to Panama to start a new life after the grief of losing her husband. And so then the officers try to make contact with his sons and they do get through to Mark and Anthony. The immediate explanation for this series of events that John had been describing, the fact that he 
had been missing for a number of years but couldn't remember anything pre-2000 could be explained by a type of brain injury. Antograde amnesia is a type of amnesia where you aren't able to remember moments after the accident itself and this can lead to forgetting the accident altogether. Post-traumatic amnesia is a kind of confused state that happens after the accident or brain injury itself. It might be that the person has no continuous memory of what's happening day to day. And symptoms of these types of amnesia can include confusion and anger, uh, distress, anxiety, uncharacteristic behaviours such as violence or shouting or uh, inability to recognise people or a tendency to just sort of wander around. And in some cases people can be very docile and sort of over friendly compared to how they would usually act. So there's a stage of recovery that happens after the injury and the Brain Injury Association headway state that the person will gradually start to hold on to more and more information and start making sense of the world around them. They also advise that it's important to remember that the person is not necessarily in control of what they say or do and shouldn't be held responsible for those actions. They say it might help the family to recognise that the person injured probably doesn't have any memory of that time. The tricky thing about any kind of amnesia, but especially post-traumatic amnesia state, is that it rarely lasts more than a few hours and certainly very rare for it to last more than a few days or weeks or months. John had been missing since the 21st of March 2002 and then he walked into that police station on the 1st of December 2007. That's almost six years and that kind of memory loss does happen but to have no inkling of who you are or where you're from or who your loved ones are and then to just suddenly remember it six years later that kind of thing just does not happen. There was a case in 2004 where a man was found unconscious next to a bin outside of a Burger King in Georgia in the USA. He was found unconscious, naked, sunburnt and covered in ant bites and he'd also suffered severe injury to his head and when he came round he had absolutely no memory of who he was or how he'd got there. He couldn't remember anything, none of his family, none of his friends, not even his own name. Doctors diagnosed him as having amnesia and he eventually began to remember that his name was Benjamin or he sort of thought it could be Benjamin and he didn't have a last name so he was given the last name Kyle and so from that point onwards he went around being known as Benjamin Kyle. He had suffered severe eye damage from this incident that had happened to him and a charity actually raised enough money to help him have corrective surgery and so nine months after he was found outside that Burger King he was actually able to look into a mirror and for the first time ever see what he looked like and so he was given this mirror and when he first saw his reflection he was shocked because he actually felt so much younger than he was and he looked about 20 years older than he had thought he was for nine months. With no sense of who he was or where he'd come from, for the next few years, Benjamin was in and out of homeless shelters and hospitals, and he was doing various odd jobs, earning around $100 a month. Over the next few years, he realized that he did know how to drive and possibly remembered his birthday. But unfortunately, he found things very tricky because he didn't have a social security number and he didn't have any form of identification, so gaining any form of employment was next to impossible. There were some petitions set up to try and get Benjamin a new social security number and some form of identification. But back in 2011, when this happened, social media didn't have the presence that it does today. And so unfortunately, nothing came of it. And then, a DNA test was conducted by a forensic psychologist and that actually helped to reunite Benjamin with his original family. The family were located in Western Carolina and they were called the Powells. He was reunited with his family and there he learnt that his name wasn't Benjamin or Benjamin Kyle, it was in fact William Burgess Powell. And there are a few other cases similar to this one 
but they are extremely rare. And for it to happen again is just highly unlikely. And there would also definitely be some sort of trail to lead us to some sort of understanding of how John ended up in that West End police station. The police were immediately suspicious and they arrested John on suspicion of fraud. Three days after John appeared in that London police station, reporters actually did manage to get in contact with Anne and they asked her how she was feeling and she said that she was thrilled and excited and confused that her husband was alive but was very much looking forward to seeing him. And later on she did say to reporters that she was a little bit fearful because she'd obviously been given a lot of insurance payouts when John had died and she was fearful that she wasn't going to be able to pay them back because she'd already spent a lot of that money on relocating to Panama. But before Anne even arrived home, police were suspicious of John's ability to commit this intense and complex fraudulent scheme on his own. And so they began looking into his wife and also his other family members. They quickly concluded that Anthony and Mark, John and Anne's sons, had no idea that their father was alive and it was genuinely a complete shock to them. However, they did not believe Anne. Officers were informed of a photograph that had been taken just a few months earlier by a man called Mario Villar. He was working at a relocation agency and he was helping a couple relocate to Panama. And on agreement of this deal that they'd struck, he asked his wife to take a photo of him and the couple that he'd helped relocate. And in that picture was Mario, Anne, and John. The photo proved that Anne was well aware of John being alive and had in fact been in regular contact with him to the point that they were actually resettling together in Panama. The couple had been living a life of lies for the last five years. The couple had built up a considerable amount of debt over the last 20 years and between them they decided that if they whacked on loads of insurance policies onto John's life and mortgage and combined with John's pensions they'd be able to just fake John's death and live off of those various insurance policies. Detectives ran a full-scale investigation into what had actually happened on that evening in March 2002. They discovered that the couple had been in massive amounts of debts and decided to do something drastic about it. On the morning of John's disappearance, he had called Anne four times and it was one of those calls that he told Anne today was the day and she should get ready to pick him up later. The rest of that day was pretty normal and Anne finished her day of work and at 6pm she headed home but rather than stopping off at home she actually continued going and she drove to the shore on North Gare. This had all been pre-arranged and when she arrived she saw John stood there and he had no canoe and he had no paddles. He'd let them drift out a few hours earlier. John got in the passenger side of the car and right now he was dressed in all black. He had a black hat on. He was trying to do anything to draw as little attention to himself as possible. Anne then drove John around 40 minutes away to Durham railway station so that he could get a train. He told her to call his work at the prison as soon as she got home. He was meant to be working a shift that night and it was pretty normal for Anne to call and speak to him. That's when Anne put her side of the plan into motion and she called up the prison and feigned surprise when they told her that John had never turned up for work. She then called the police and that's when that massive search was launched. During that search, obviously a ton of money was spent, but also many people literally risked their lives trying to find John and both John and Anne knew that he would never be found. John had actually set up camp a few miles down the coast and he waited there just waiting for things to die down and then he would travel further across the country. He then spent some time in the Lake District in the northwest of England. He knew that being there there was no way that he'd be recognised. But it wasn't long before he found it hard with no money and being on his own and so he returned to Seton Carew. And so Anne drove to Whitehaven in Cumbria to go and pick him up 
and that's literally across the other side of the country but it's England so it's just like two and a half hours to drive there so she drives and she picks him up and brings him back to Seton Carew and they made sure to do this in the middle of the night so that no one would see them and when they get back they go to the family house which is number three and they actually have an adjoining house which is number four and they'd usually rent that out during the holiday season and so over the next few months John would generally live with Anne at number three, but if there were visitors round or any unexpected guests, he would scurry across to number four and he'd hide out there. He even used this time to concrete across the floorboards and build a sort of secret passage so that it wouldn't creak when he went across and he could move back and forth freely and without drawing attention to himself. John disguised himself by wearing long coats and growing his beard out, and this meant that only a month after he'd gone missing, he'd actually take trips down to the coastline in Seton Carew, and he even joined the local library. He used the fake name John Jones to uh, join the library, and this actually spurred him on to create a whole new identity. He was fed up of living secretly, and he wanted to have a life of independence, so he knew that he'd have to do this properly. He used this name, John Jones, to register at the library, and although he'd actually made that name up, he very quickly learnt that there had been a little boy called John Jones who was born in 1950, and he died after just five weeks from an infection, so it was very easy then for John to take his identity and use it as his own. It actually worked, and he was able to get a birth certificate and a passport. I thought that getting a passport would actually be quite a bit more difficult but because he had that birth certificate and he was now a regular at the library he was able to get the librarian to sign a form to say that he was a regular customer and so that made it much easier for him to get a passport. Weirdly he actually ordered that passport to his home address so in some ways some of the things he does it's almost as though he's not bothered about getting caught he does some really risky things. And obviously being at home, he would sometimes be with his wife, Anne, but often she'd obviously have to go out to work and then he was at home alone and he got bored pretty quickly. He started playing this video game called Asheron's Call and he would spend hours and hours every day playing that. It's like a fantasy game, but you get to like make your own character. So it's the perfect place to be anonymous if you need to be. And it said that he liked playing this because it gave him a sense of independence. You can earn money and you can buy property and land and you can also speak to other people. And so during this time that he was playing the game, he met this woman called Kelly and the two began talking and they actually formed quite a connection and he found out that she lived in Kansas City in the US and that she had been divorced three times and that she was looking for love. And so the two started emailing each other and then calling each other and eventually he started sending her money. And once John received his passport, he actually booked a flight to the US to go and meet Kelly face to face. And he did this straight after telling Anne that he needed a bit of a break. And whilst he was in the US, Kelly actually brought him a, a 10 acre farm, which was in her name, but it was sort of on his behalf and it was for him. But soon after this, their romance fizzled out and he returned back to the UK with nothing and had to go crawling back to Anne, asking if she would take him in. And whilst there, he would spend his days inside, but he also would venture down to the local seaside. And although he was disguised, he's still himself and he'd been living there for years and years so it was quite a risky thing. Anne came into the house in a bit of a panic and she told John that someone had seen him and they'd recognised him. It was one of his old prison colleagues and Anne had tried to defuse the situation and said obviously it can't have been him, he's dead and that it must have been a lookalike cousin, that's all it was. And whether the prison colleague believed her or not, we don't know, but this prison colleague didn't report it to the police. And so either they believed it or they just decided to look the other way. And this wasn't the only time that John had been recognized. 
there was a point when one of their regular tenants ran into John and looked him in the eyes, realised who it was and asked him, aren't you supposed to be dead? To which he just begged him not to say anything and then ran home. It was a close call and after no one came knocking, there was no police presence at their door, John and Anne thought that they had gotten away with it. They were worried though. They'd had these two sightings in a very short period of time and they knew that if they stayed in Seton Carew, they were seriously likely to be caught. And that's when the couple decided to leave Seton Carew. In 2004, they booked flights out to Cyprus and they went and they explored and they viewed a number of plots of land and properties. But after speaking to a number of people out there, they realised that the process was actually quite long and they didn't want to wait. So they sort of abandoned that idea and started to look for somewhere else to move to. They did return home in the meantime and John began living a little bit more secretively. But it wasn't long before he didn't like this kind of lifestyle and decided that he needed to get away. And so he went to Spain and Gibraltar and he inquired about buying a boat for £50,000. John wanted to be able to travel without fear of getting caught, but Anne wasn't so sure. And so after the couple talked about this £50,000 boat, they decided that actually they would prefer to be on land and they'd wait and find somewhere else abroad that they could move to. John spent his days searching the internet for the perfect place that they could live and it wasn't long before he came across Panama. And then he started sorting out various viewings. He was always posing as his wife so he'd write emails as Anne. And then in the summer of 2006, the pair flew to Central America and they planned to go there just on a bit of a holiday, but they were also going to be looking at some properties. They fell in love with Panama and it wasn't long before they'd made the decision they were definitely going to resettle there. And so they set up some meetings and started getting things ready to go for their move. And one of these meetings was with Mario Villar, who was the director of Move to Panama. On agreement of this deal, Mario asked his wife to take a photo of him and the happy couple and that's that photo that came to the police's attention earlier. Anne immediately panicked. She knew that this photo was proof that John was alive and proof that she knew. She headed back to England as soon as she could so that she could finalise things for their move and they could get out of England forever. Whilst she was there, John would send her frantic emails and he'd do it often and he would talk about planning for their future and he'd also send really explicit sexual emails about being naked on the balcony waiting for her. But that was all temporary. Soon, John learned that Panama immigration laws had changed. If he wanted a life with any kind of freedom, he had to get a letter from the police testifying to his good character. And that is the moment that he decided to return to England. He told Anne what he was going to do and obviously she told him this was a ridiculous idea but he decided to go ahead with it anyway and so on that December evening in 2007 he walked into that West End police station and claimed to have lost his memory. John pleaded guilty to seven charges of obtaining cash by deception and one passport offence in 2008. Anne denied six charges of deception and nine of using criminal property and she was found guilty at Teesside Crown Court. John was sentenced to six years and three months and Anne was sentenced to six years and six months. The judge did say that John was the driving force behind the scheme and that he'd organised it and planned it and got Anne on board. But the judge also said that Anne was integral to the success of the fraud scheme and that she played her part efficiently and wholeheartedly. John was released in 2011 and all he had to say to the press was, quote, I took money from an insurance company, but I didn't kill anyone. I mean, he's not wrong, but he does seem to forget the fact that all those people went searching for him and risked their lives and loads of resource and money was spent on trying to find him when he didn't even need 
rescuing. And the most mind-blowing thing, which I've not really spoken about yet, is the fact that he let his two sons believe that he was dead and really believe that he may never see them again. And his wife was okay with that too. Anne, their mother, was perfectly fine with her two sons thinking that their father had died. I'm really close to my family, so I can't even comprehend it. I have no idea how that even comes into your mind. But that was a decision that he consciously made and went through with. Um, anyway, Anne was then released three months after John, also in 2011. And during their time in prison, John and Anne actually got a divorce. And it's reported that that was because Anne found out that John had been writing letters to women outside of prison saying that he had a really high sex drive. They had been married for 38 years by the time they got a divorce and it wasn't long after that that John met another woman called Anna online and they started dating. By 2011, Anne had actually paid off over half a million pounds of the money that she owed and I think that's partially from the money she still had from the insurance policies, but also from the property money because she'd sold loads of property and had all that money before she'd moved to Panama. By that same year, 2011, John had paid just £122 of the 700000 that he owed. After his release from prison, he headed out to the Ukraine to meet with Anna, who was the woman that he'd been talking to and this was actually a violation of his probation so the minute he returned to Newcastle and touched back down he was arrested and taken straight back to prison. That relationship didn't work out and then John met another woman called Mercy who's from the Philippines and they got married in 2015 and he actually moved out to the Philippines which was allowed by this point and he lives there now and he receives state pension of £140 a week. Anne paid back all the money that she owed and she actually moved to York where she works for the RSPCA animal charity and she has a really good relationship with both of her sons who have forgiven her for what she did. This is a fascinating case. I just, I will never understand how Anne and John thought that they were going to get away with it but also how they could do that to their own sons and all of their family and loved ones. And I'm not the only one who found this case incredibly fascinating. Um, it actually has been made into TV shows and films and a book has been written by Anne. So you could read that if you wanted to. And last year in 2021, a four part mini series uh, called The Thief, The Wife and The Canal Man. That might not be it, I'll find out what it is. Um, was in production so that will probably be out this year so keep an eye out for that if you're interested in this story. This is Humans, true stories about the most intriguing parts of human behaviour, the good, the bad and the downright horrific. If you have enjoyed this episode of Humans consider clicking the thumbs up button, apparently it really helps us out, I don't know how but yeah that would be really great if you could do that, if you liked it. If you didn't like it, you don't click the like button because that's silly. Just don't click the dislike button. Um, just leave, please. Thank you. And if you'd like more than 10 episodes, also let me know because I can do more. I just don't want to do more if it's just my mum watching. Hi, mum. Um, subscribe if you're not already subscribed so you never miss an episode. If you like true crime and you like podcasts, you might like Red Rum True Crime Podcasts which I host and write and do all that sort of stuff. And other than that, I'll see you next week, two weeks, in two weeks, probably, for episode six? Episode six? What will that be? I don't know. Oh, let me know if, if there's any cases you want me to cover. Leave a comment with that on it. And I love covering cases that are a bit lesser known or like there's not loads of coverage on them because otherwise I'm like, I don't know what I can bring. But hopefully you haven't heard this case before. If you have, I've brought something a little bit different to it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in two weeks for episode six. Goodbye.